without you I fall apart and you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need you Lord I need you Good morning, First Southern. Will you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the ability to be able to do church, Lord. We thank you for the technology that makes this all possible. And even though that we might be spread out, Lord, that we can come together as one to sing praises and glory to you. Lord, this morning I pray for Pastor Chad as he brings a message that you wanted him to deliver to us. And Lord, as a church and congregation, I pray, Lord, that we're ready to receive it, that we can apply it to our own lives, Lord, and that we don't just hear it to hear a Sunday sermon. Lord, I pray that you use us to go out into the world, to proclaim your name, to spread your gospel, Lord. I pray that you give us a heart for those that are in the community that are hurting, that don't know you, Lord, and that we can have patience and Christ-like relationships with them, Lord, ultimately so that we can point them all to you. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you, that you're working on them, Lord, that you're softening their heart, preparing them for conversations and tough questions to be asked. But Lord, I pray that you give us the boldness to go out, to share our testimony, to share our faith in relationship with you, and not to hide it, Lord, and to keep it concealed and never share, Lord. 
Lord, again, we thank you so much for this morning. We know nothing uh, is without your doing, Lord. Everything that is provided is provided by you, Lord. And we thank you for that. Lord, again, we thank you for Chad as he leads us in today's message. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and today we're going to be in two separate passages like we've been doing for the last few weeks. The first passage is Matthew chapter 5. The second passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So Matthew 5, 2 Corinthians 7. Now, I get it. It's, these two books can be hard to find. I mean, there's, there's 66 books in this book. Uh, so let me give you some clues, some hints on how to locate Matthew and 2 Corinthians. If you're in a physical Bible, just simply open up to the table of contents. That's the surefire, easiest way uh, to find those two books. Both of these books are found in the section uh, called the New Testament. So in the table of contents, find the New Testament. The first book uh, in the New Testament is Matthew, the book that we're in today. And you go several books in past that one, you'll find 2 Corinthians. So Matthew and 2 Corinthians. Now, if you're in an app, simply pull down the list of the books of the Bible. You'll find that Matthew is about two thirds of the way down that list. And 2 Corinthians is just under three quarters of the way down that list. So again, Matthew 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, have you ever been in a situation where you just were able to give everything into whatever it was you were doing? Uh, I get to go to uh, our church camp every summer. Uh, I'm the director for this church camp that we're a part of. Uh, and I absolutely love going because one of the best things about it is you get to worship in this room w with hundreds of teenagers and adults who are there loving the Lord and worshiping Him. And there's there's something about being in that setting with, with that kind of a, a group of people that you just find it so interesting easy to to give God everything in that moment. I mean, you, you worship and you find yourself giving and worshiping with your body, with your emotions, with your, your thinking, with your spirit. The, there's just every part of your being is being given in worship to Him. And, you know, it's, it's different with different settings, but have you ever been in a scenario, in a situation where you just gave it all, every last ounce of who you are, every aspect of your being just being poured out or poured into whatever it was you were, you were experiencing or you were doing. Well, today, we're gonna kind of touch on that because Jesus wants us to give us our all. He wants us to give him our everything. And so we're going to unpack some of that today with a, a difficult passage, a, a statement that Jesus makes that may be kind of hard for us to wrap our minds and our hearts around. So, so take your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Now as you're turning there, this is what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. We're in the beginning of this very famous sermon that Jesus preaches. It's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. And the introduction to this Sermon on the Mount is commonly called the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes, in relation to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes builds the foundation on which Jesus builds everything else within the Sermon on the Mount. So the Beatitudes are vitally important to us being able to understand the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. And you can read the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, it's a three, three chapters of, of message, of, of teaching from Jesus. And so now let's look at the Beatitudes, this intro to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 3. It says this, Blessed 
are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so also they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been covering the first of these Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Today we're covering verse four, the second Beatitude. And let me repeat it. Verse four, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, it doesn't make sense that those who mourn are also blessed. There's, there's a deep meaning to what Jesus is teaching here. And just like with the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, there's actually a double meaning. It's not just those who mourn physically, but there is a spiritual mourning. So I want to talk about both of those meanings. First one is the spiritual meaning. You see, we are called to mourn spiritually. Well, how do we do that? Well, when I sin, I should be regretful. I should uh, be sad. I should mourn the fact that that sin ha has happened in my life. Uh, there, there's an aspect of, of following Christ called repentance. Repentance is when we sin and we recognize that sin and we're sad that we did it. And out of recognizing that we've committed a sin, disobeying God, that we recognize we do it and we regret, we're regretful for it, that we repent, meaning we turn away, we, we go away from that sin. Uh, we, we, make, we take steps to not return or, or go down that path again that led us to that sin. And so the first aspect of mourning that Jesus is talking about is mourning our sin. Now, uh, go to that second passage that I told you to turn to, 2 Corinthians 7. You see, Jesus, through the, the, the man Paul, Paul wrote this book, 2 Corinthians. Through Paul, Jesus speaks and Jesus teaches us about mourning our sin and what that means, what it looks like. And so 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 8. So 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8, it says this. For even if I made you grieve in my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. It, Paul's unpacking some of the things that he said in a previous letter to this, this group of people. You see, this is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in the city of Corinth. Uh, you find it now in modern day Turkey. Uh, but in Corinth, he had written this letter to this church and he had really kind of called them out on some sins that they were living in. And in this letter, in 2 Corinthians, in chapter seven, he goes, you know, guys, I, I'm sad that I kind of had to say those things. But, and I'm sad that it grieved you, but I'm not sad about the grief itself because the grief led you to repent, to, again, turn away from your sin. And so Paul talks about how grieving, mourning your sin is part of the process of repenting of your sin, turning away so that you don't come back to that sin again or you're less likely to return to that sin again. And so it, there is an aspect of mourning that is spiritual. We mourn that we disobey God. We mourn the fact that sometimes we know the right thing we should do, 
but we don't do it. And so there is an aspect of spiritual mourning that is healthy, that is good for us. Uh, For example, there are many of the writers uh, in the Bible who, who mourned various things. There are many of the prophets in the Old Testament in the Bible that mourned different sins. For example, you know, Peter grieves his sin. Paul grieves his sin. They grieve the sins of the people uh, that they love. Uh, Jeremiah in the Old Testament, he was a prophet and he grieved over the sins of the nation of Israel that made them guilty. Uh, Jesus himself wept when he saw Jerusalem and recognized the sin that Jerusalem had been caught up in. So we should be saddened by the things that sadden God. Uh, The fact is, is sin, disobedience from God makes God sad. It saddens his heart. When we sin, uh, it doesn't make God happy. And so because sin uh, is not something that God rejoices in, then we shouldn't either. We should grieve when we sin. Sin is not a matter that should uh, make us happy. We shouldn't get callous to it. We shouldn't get used to it. We shouldn't celebrate sin. And so what breaks God's heart ought to break our hearts as well. And so when you're grieving your sin, what should you do? What are the application? What are the action steps that you should go through when repenting, when when grieving the sin that you're caught up in or that you've committed? First off, you got to recognize the sin. You've got to recognize I've done this It's not the right thing. It goes against God's will. It's a sin. So you've got to first off, recognize it. Secondly, you got to go to the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. You've got to say, God, I recognize this sin and now I need you to forgive me because I can't forgive myself. Then you need in your sorrow, in your grief, in your mourning over that sin. Thirdly, you ask God to help you repent of that sin. Just like 2 Corinthians says that when we grieve that sin, when we mourn that sin, that helps us to turn away from the sin because we regret it. We we don't like that we've done it. And so we ask God to help us in that process to repent, to turn away, to, to not return to that temptation and sin again. And then uh, to to not la- to, sorry the the fourth thing is to allow God through that mourning and repentance to to ask God to help you resist those temptations to keep you a- away from those temptations in the future and so there is a spiritual mourning that's actually really good for our spiritual health so. The first meaning to blessed are those who mourn in Matthew 5, 4 is that we mourn our sin. We mourn the ways that we have disobeyed God, that we've disappointed God, that we've we've turned away from God, that we've not done the right thing we should do. That's the first type of mourning that this beatitude is talking about. But there is a second type of mourning that Jesus is speaking of. You see, sometimes... We go through difficult times, we go through loss, we go through pain and hurt, and we mourn in that. You see, there's healthiness in mourning, just mourning the circumstances of your life, mourning the loss of a loved one. There's good things. God has designed us to mourn when we have loss or pain. You see, God uses our pain. There's a purpose behind it. Uh, He never wastes our pain. He he never lets our pain be for nothing, but we have to embrace the fact that we're going through pain. We have to mourn through the pain and we have to come out on the other side of that pain. There's a blessing in it. There is comfort in it, but there are many, many examples of people who have experienced loss in the Bible and have 
mourned in that moment. God commands it in the Old Testament. He actually gave instruction uh, that, that the people of Israel, when someone experienced loss, that, that they were supposed to allow that person to go through a mourning process. They were supposed to give them the space and the room to be able to mourn. They were supposed to mourn with them. Uh, John 11, uh, ch- uh, ch- John chapter 11, verse 35 there's this account, this, this story of Jesus' life. He's got this very good friend. Uh, he receives news that this friend of his is sick. And he, he takes his time going to see the friend. And so he, he takes his time going to see him. And while he waits, uh, while he takes his time going back, this friend of his passes away. And by the time Jesus arrives in the town where this friend of his uh, had lived, His friend has died and he's been already buried. He's been in the tomb a few days now. And Jesus talks to this person's relatives. He gives some beautiful teaching and some wisdom that we can learn from today. But then he goes to the tomb and he's about to do something very miraculous. You see this this friend of Jesus's is named Lazarus. And, and towards uh, the end of John 11, Jesus walks up to the tomb and he tells the guys that are there, roll the stone away. And, and he calls in, he says, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. You see, he, ri- he raises Lazarus from the dead. And he, he knew he was going to do that. But before all of that happens, as he walks to the tomb, he gets close and he sees everybody crying. He sees the family who are mourning and they're suffering. And in John 11, verse 35, it says two words, Jesus wept. Simply, Jesus wept. As Jesus approached the tomb of his friend Lazarus and saw the people mourning, he wept. Now, what's interesting is this Greek word, Matthew, or John, the, the book that I'm quoting from, was originally written in Greek. And the Greek word there does not simply mean uh, that he cried a little bit or he shed a tear. No, the Greek word means that he cried loudly and wept very openly. It was a, it was a loud, you know, very observed, very, very prevalent. I'm struggling to find the words here. Clearly, it wasn't a quiet cry. He was crying. He wept. He mourned the loss of his friend. And think about this for just a second. He knows perfectly well that he's about to turn around and call Lazarus out of that grave, that he knows he's about to ask Lazarus to be raised from the dead. And yet, Watching everybody grieve, watching everybody mourn Lazarus' death and looking at the tomb, Jesus himself, knowing that what was about to happen, himself wept out loud. He mourned the loss of his friends. You see, in the book of Romans, also found in the New Testament, in the book of Romans 12, 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I'm going to be honest for a second. I'm, I, I want to be blunt with us. We as Baptists, we're a Baptist church. We as Baptists struggle to show our emotions. We do. It is a fact. We are bottled up. We're closed up generally when it comes to expressing ourselves, just in general, not everybody. And we need to learn to do better. We need to learn to rejoice when others are rejoicing. We need to learn to mourn when others are mourning. And that leads me to today's big idea. If you've ever listened to one of my messages, you know that I, I don't generally give a lot of points and this and that. I, I want you to remember one main thing. And today's big idea is this. God wants all of you. So don't hold back. It's that simple. God wants all of you. Stop holding back. Stop, stop limiting yourself. Stop uh, limiting what God calls you to do and give him all of you. You see, I think as, as Baptists, maybe as, as 
people that live in Phoenix, I don't know, but we have a tendency to be a little too serious, a little too bottled up, a little too controlled. We're too afraid of what people will think if we open up emotionally. We're afraid of what people will think of us. We think that maybe we'll be judged, but, but, but we're called to rejoice with others when they're rejoicing. We're called to mourn with those who are mourning. We need to laugh. We need to weep. We need to celebrate. We need to love, and we need to do all of those things with passion openly, transparently. You see, Ecclesiastes is a book found in the Old Testament. In Ecclesiastes chapter three, it says that there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. The Bible repeatedly talks to us about the importance of both extremes of this spectrum, that there are times that we must mourn We must weep, we must cry. And there are times when we must laugh. We must rejoice, we must celebrate. Just over 10 years ago, my dad passed away. And I went through a time of mourning. Now, I am so blessed. I had friends, I have an amazing wife who all mourned with me. They walked with me as I mourned the loss of this great man in my life. But in the morning, in my morning, I didn't live in it. I knew that there was always hope on the other side of mourning. I always was looking for what God was doing in my morning. You know, in that morning, I was able to tell others about Jesus. I had the great opportunity to share Christ because Dad wanted me to uh, perform his funeral. And I got to speak about the hope of Jesus in that while I was mourning. Mourning is hard. It's messy. It's difficult. And many times I think we shy away from mourning because it's because of those things. It's difficult. It's messy. But, But please hear me. Life is not always cut and dry and clean and neat. Sometimes life is messy. Sometimes life is difficult. Sometimes life is chaotic. And sometimes we're called to walk with people who are going through the difficulty, who are going through the mess, who are going through the chaos. And we're supposed to mourn with them. We're supposed to love on them. And we're supposed to encourage them. But there's hope in this beatitude in Matthew 5. You see, the the beatitude says, blessed are those who mourn, but why? For they will be comforted. You see, we find comfort in the midst of our mourning. You know, I've got a four-year-old and just the other night he was playing around and he took a hard fall and he hurt himself. When he was going through that pain, when he was crying, he came to me. You see, there's comfort in the father. There's comfort to the child. There's comfort in the parent. You know, when we hurt, we should be crying out to God for comfort. When we sin, we cry out to God for forgiveness and he is faithful and just to forgive us. The Bible promises us that. And in that forgiveness, he provides comfort. Listen to this passage. This is 2 Corinthians, that other book that we were in. But instead of being in chapter 7, this is the first chapter of that book. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are also in any affliction with the comfort 
with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, some of you may be mourning right now. Some of you may be struggling through a painful situation. Please hear me. God wants you to be comforted. That comfort doesn't come immediately. When my dad passed, the process of mourning took long periods of time and there are aspects of mourning that I'm still going through 10 years later. But the fact of the matter is, is that I did receive comfort as I mourned. God wants you to receive comfort, both in your mourning from your, in your sin and in mourning through the things that are happening in your life. Mourning is appropriate. Weeping is appropriate, but we don't live in the weeping. We don't live in the mourning. We don't live in the sorrow. We live in knowing that through the weeping, through the mourning, through the sorrow, there's comfort at the end. And, And Maybe some of you listening or watching right now, maybe you could use some comfort. Maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you're going through something painful in your life. And please hear me. Jesus wants to provide you with comfort. He wants you, he he wants to take you from mourning to healing. He wants to give that to you. You see, Jesus loves you so much that he came and died on a cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins. And three days later, he rose from the grave. And that that rising from the grave was a proclamation, was a statement that he has victory over sin and death and all the chaos and destruction that we experience in this life. And he wants to, in that victory, he wants to provide you comfort as you go through pain and suffering and mourning and sorrow. He wants to give you healing and comfort. And if you want to know more about Jesus, if if you've got questions, if, if you could use some healing and comfort in your life, I want you to reach out to us. Here's what I want you to do. In the post of this video, there's, there's a, a little link in front of it that says, contact us, and then it has a link right after it. That link will take you to the contact us page of our website. I want you to click on that link, go to the contact us page of our website, fill out that form, and I will reach out to you. I would love uh, to answer any questions that you may have about Jesus, about the comfort that we're talking about, the healing that we're talking about. Uh, maybe you're, you're wanting to know more about a journey with Jesus. Either way, I, I want you to reach out to us uh, and ask the questions that you may have. But, but hear me, when Jesus provides us comfort, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in that comfort, we're called to go out and provide comfort to others. You see, we are supposed to be the instruments of comfort into the lives of the people around us. When we mourn with those who mourn, we help provide comfort to those who need comfort. And so we, in our pain, in our mourning, as we receive comfort, we become instruments of comfort to others. So let me close with a couple of questions. Do you mourn your sin? Is, is, is your sin something that, that saddens you, that, that you are sorrowful over? And secondly, do you mourn with those who mourn? Do you mourn when you go through pain in your own life, but knowing that mourning leads to comfort in Jesus? I think it's time that we go to the Lord and we ask him to lead us in mourning and lead us in comfort. So join me now in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the fact that we're not supposed to hold back our emotions from you. We're not supposed to bottle them up, 
but instead you call us to rejoice with those who rejoice, you to laugh and to dance, <clears throat> to dance, but you also call us to weep, to mourn, and in that to be comforted. And Lord, we pray that if there is any way that we are holding back, that we are not giving all of ourselves to you, we pray that you would help us through your Holy Spirit to let go and to give those things to you. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone listening right now who is mourning, who is weeping, who is in the midst of sorrow, Lord, I pray that you would begin to, to walk them towards down that road of comfort, that you would provide comfort in their lives. We thank you, Lord. Help us to mourn. Help us to mourn with those who mourn. Help us to laugh. Help us to laugh with those who laugh. Help us to rejoice. Help us to rejoice with those who rejoice. Help us to dance. Help us to dance with those who dance as your word calls us to. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of this in our comforter's name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.